Who are your uh, heroes growing up? Chess, uh, chess heroes. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely be Gary. And I think one of the biggest reasons is because I was very fortunate in 1995. I did go to the World Championship match between Kasparov and Anand at the World Trade Center. And originally, we were supposed to go to game number nine. Now, they drew the first eight games. Anand won that very nice game in, in round nine. And then Gary played that amazing game of the Open Spanish in game 10. And um, originally, I was supposed to go to game nine. But when I went, went to game 10, it was just... I remember that atmosphere, and I have to say, I don't think I've seen anything quite like it since. They were playing like in this enclosed glass uh, glass room, basically, uh, way up at the top of the World Trade Center. And just seeing the commentary, I mean, I think people like Maurice and Yas were there. Mm -hmm. It was it was amazing. And even into the early 2000s, I remember I'd get up very early, like 8 or 9 a.m., maybe even earlier, uh, to watch this like ridiculously blurry webcam uh, from, from Vike on Zay or from Linares watching Gary's games. And he was definitely the biggest hero of mine growing up. And you also got trained with him. Tell us a bit I did. about that. Yeah, so now that was much later in 2011. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. I think our styles and our personalities kind of clashed a little bit. And um, also, I would say at that time, it was a different place in my life. I wasn't, wasn't really sure of where, where I was going in chess. And so I was a little bit hard-headed at times. Um, I learned a lot. I learned, I, th I think the main thing I learned is that Gary, even, even if he can't play at the level he once did, he still has a lot of ideas. He's still very creative and he's, he remains a very, very strong chess player. Whether he could compete with the top, I mean, probably not at this point, but I learned that he could still find a lot of great ideas. And I also learned, you know, a sort of some of the players that he likes, some of the players that he doesn't like either. Did you feel that helped you at all in your assessment and, uh, you know, in clashes, oh. future clashes with those type of players? I think just sort of, knowing their personalities. Yeah, I mean, I think probably more than anyone else, and this isn't very surprising, but I learned a lot about Kramnik from mm. working working with Gary and sort of like what are the lines that he goes for, how he approaches the openings, things of that nature. Because um, because Gary's kind of obsessed with him, not not surprisingly, um, and and that that was probably the player that I learned the most about though during the time working with Gary. What were you guys working on? Were you focusing mostly on like middle game, end game, or were you actually looking at opening lines? Was she sharing anything with you? Um, primarily, without revealing too much. Yeah, obviously. primarily it was openings. I mean, it was openings and then mostly like calculation studies, things of that nature. Those were the things that we were really focusing on. I think. Um, you know, obviously, Nidorf is something where Gary came with with a lot of ideas. I think you actually could see it in my play because during that period in 2011, there there were some of these ideas I came up with in this night G4 Nidorf. I had this game against Sergey in uh, Bosnia and Romania. Uh, also in that tournament, I think I had this. I had another idea in in the um, Bishop G5 Knight BD7 variation against Timur Rajba. There was like this 40 move, just completely booked out draw that I had. So Nidorf was probably the main opening. I mean, that's not, not a surprise to anybody who's, who's listening or watching this, but um, that it was mostly the openings. I, I heard, and I, you can, you probably have more insight on this, but I heard that it's very difficult for two really great players or two very strong players to work together because there's always that, that competitive competitiveness between mm -hmm. both players that leads to a clash and did you feel that when you were with Gary that he was too competitive to to work with? Well, I mean, I like to, to start with probably the first hot take. I have a feeling that you and I, we could probably look at stuff and work together and not have, have any issues. And I, I think that's because we're like we're peers. We're from the same generation. I mean, not completely, but close enough in age. I feel like with Gary, there's this... Uh, Gary, Gary at the time, at least, I mean, now I think I would say Magnus is better and maybe that's a topic for later, but uh, Gary is the, he, he is, was the best player in history. And I always got the sense that Gary thought he was always right, no matter what. Um, and I think it's very hard kind of to deal with that when one person always thinks they're right. Like, I, I think the, the, the younger generation, I, maybe this has something to do with computers too, but like, I think we're much more objective about like, we're, we're all very good, but I don't think it's like one person's right, one person's wrong. That's just not how it is because computers, I think, show us that everybody can have their own opinions and, and be right um, on many different different positions, opening prep, everything. And I think for me, that was the hardest thing is Gary's just, uh, he, he was always right, no matter what. And it's, were you guys bashing heads at any moment and you were coming with the engine and saying, look, Gary, the engine is saying this and the engines were pretty decent at that point. Right. I mean, I, th I think, again, it's it's hard, though, because for me, when you grow up idolizing someone like that, it's very hard to contradict. It's so very, you're very a bit reluctant. Sort of say, say things and like go against them. Yeah. I mean, it's very tough uh, to do that because, I mean, he, he was my hero growing up. Um, so I think it's it's more more that than anything. I, I feel like, you know, any top player today 
it would it would be possible. Sure, you might you might clash and butt heads, but I, I think nowadays we're we're much more realistic uh, about everything. You also mentioned that you didn't really know where you are in your chess career at that mm-hmm. point. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so like 2011, I think I was. I'm guessing I was somewhere around 2740, 2750 ish. Um, and I wasn't sure, like, am I am I going to like be 2800, 2850? Am I going to be the world champion, or am I going to get stuck there? I mean, I was also at that time in 2011, I was what, 20, 23, 24 ish, um, or 24, 25 ish. And I wasn't like, I had kind of broken in, but I wasn't sure is it stable? Is it not stable? I just, I really didn't know. And I think also for, for just in life in general, the 20s, um, I remember hearing this from, from someone, the 20s are like the most chaotic time in your life. And for me, like, there was a lot of stuff going on. Like, I was, I had just moved to St. Louis the year before, before that. I considered like quitting chess and I was living up in Canada for a bit and then in the Pacific Northwest. So it was just a time when I wasn't really sure. And I, I looking back in a way, I kind of wish I had been more disciplined hmm. about chess during that during that time period, 2011 specifically, uh, when I was working with Gary. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think everything happens for a reason and everything's worked out. 